Hello. So in this 10th uh, theme of the environmental and natural resource economics course, uh, we finally turn to the natural resource economics. And we start with uh, considering uh, non-renewable natural resources. And in this first part of the, of the video lessons, I will dis discuss this kind of theoretical model of optimal resource extraction and uh, and uh, the basic result in this uh, this area is the so-called Hotelling's rule. So firstly, let's briefly discuss the distinction between renewable and uh, non-renewable resources. So this might sound very, very obvious, uh, and I'm sure that you are, have heard about it before, but um, uh, perhaps the distinction is not always exactly so, so clear. So, and, and the distinction is rather pragmatic. So renewable is uh, something that uh, can be replenished fairly easily. So for example, if you talk about renewable energy, uh, typical examples include solar energy and wind energy. Uh, if you are, if you are really getting to like to the, to the bottom of it, of course, we know from the physics that, uh, that uh, the sun uh, the lifetime of the sun is also also um, also uh, finite. So eventually, this this type of energy will also run out. But we can think about a kind of human time scale rather than some kind of uh, astronomical time scales here. Then non-renewable is uh, something that cannot be replenished, uh, and here is also this uh, additional qualification, at least not in our lifetime. So then typical examples of non-renewable sources or non-renewable energy sources particularly include, for example, fossil fuels such as coal and oil. And um, of course, uh, we, we know that, that basically coal and oil are all like fossilized uh, plants. So if we give enough, give enough time, of course, it would be also possible to, to create new coal or new oil, but not, not within our lifetime. So this is this kind of uh, rather pragmatic uh, distinction, what is what is renewable or non-renewable. But uh, my main point here is to that you also like uh, think about it uh, uh, clearly that uh, that uh, what exactly where, where, where to draw the boundary and uh, and it's not uh, not always uh, e exactly clear. Anyway, we don't get to some kind of hair splitting here. So let's move to the then then the question of how to um, how to manage some some uh, uh, non-renewable resource. So so let's consider a simple uh, simple model of uh, optimal resource extraction. And uh, we need to make some simplifying assumptions here. So let's suppose that uh, that. Uh, we have a private owner or potentially many private owners who own a, a complete stock of a natural resource. We can think about oil reserve as an, as an example. So potentially we have many, many private owners like, like in, the, in the real world, there is of course lots of, uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of owners. Some of them of course are government uh, owned as well, but we simply assume that there's only, only private, uh, uh, private benefits here. And uh, an important assumption here is that the complete stock of the resource is fully known and there is no, no more of the resource. And uh, once the stock is withdrawn, then uh, it's, it's, uh, it's used completely with no waste and not any kind of, uh, nothing left over for reuse. And uh, the stock can, cannot regenerate itself, so that's why it is, uh, is non-renewable. And uh, we simply ignore the cost of withdrawing. So the extraction of the resource, uh, we, we could assume that the, the cost is equal to zero. Of course, we could also, also easily add some kind of uh, constant uh, cost per unit uh, and that wouldn't really change anything. And uh, also we ignore any alternatives to the, to the resource. Uh, so the question that arises then, how would uh, we maximize profits of the resource, which which uh, which is uh, which is finite and will eventually run out? So, 
this diagram tries to illustrate the, the important result known as the Hotelling's rule. So it's the same same Hotelling who, who uh, was also uh, behind the idea of the travel cost method that we that we discussed in the previous lesson. So so he was very very uh, multiple talented and uh, productive person in his time. So this figure might look look first uh, somewhat uh, somewhat uh, difficult to read. So let's let's uh, discuss it. Uh, uh, one one quadrant at a time. So so let's first start from the top left quadrant of the figure. So there is the amount of resource this R on the on the uh, horizontal axis to the left of the origin, and then there's net price uh, on the on the vertical axis on the top. So so let's consider this. Uh, what is the demand curve? Uh, uh, for the for the resource and and like usually in economics we assume this kind of downward sloping sloping demand curve uh, connecting the 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 price and the and the quantity of the resource so this is this uh, r refers to not not the stock but the but the flow from the stock so in some sense you could think of it as a the consumption which would be equal to the extraction so this is just the usual kind of demand curve but it's just kind of mirror image from the usual type of uh, inverse demand curves that uh, that we have so so the demand curve makes this kind of connection between the price and quantity so then if you, if you look at the left but bottom part of the quadrant uh, where there is a uh, the, there is on the vertical axis down we have time and then there is the amount of resource used so so then this kind of gray area in the diagram uh, this uh, this uh, surface area indicates the total resource stock uh, and then over time then as 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 we we extract the, the resource then then uh, then uh, there will be less and less resource and also then this uh, withdrawal will be will be decreasing over time. So if we follow this uh, this uh, straight line, uh, the straight line would indicate that uh, that this uh, this um, uh, amount of resource uh, withdrawn will will uh, will decrease over time. Slowly, slowly but surely. And then if you look at the bottom right quadrant, so there is simply forty five degree line. So this forty-five degree line allows us to convert this uh, uh, time on the on this um, bottom vertical axis to the to the right uh, horizontal axis. So there's time also here on both axes of the of the uh, bottom right quadrant. We have time. So then this forty-five degree line just projects this time to this uh, this other axis. And then perhaps the most interesting part is this. Uh, uh, top right quadrant of the figure where we have time on the horizontal axis and price on the on the on the vertical vertical axis upwards and uh, this this indicates that as the as uh, the uh, follow following the demand curve of course when when over time less and less uh, of the resource is available and extracted in the time unit then then the price path of the resource will, will increase over time. And eventually there is some kind of exhaust price at which, uh, which then, then uh, this, uh, when, when, when this uh, last units of the resource are consumed then the price reaches its, its peak. And then, then there is no, no resource left. All of the reserve has been exhausted. So, so this is this kind of um, optimal optimal extraction path for the for this kind of kind of in, in this kind of simple uh, resource extraction model and uh, the as 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 i as i mentioned this kind of price price path in this figure is particularly this price path is known as the hotelling rule so this can be seen as this kind of um, optimality condition, or according to permanent old textbook, they refer to it as an intertemporal efficiency condition. 
which must be satisfied by any efficient process of resource extraction. So a few words about this, uh, this uh, formula, perhaps this uh, symbol dot on the top, top of price uh, um, is not familiar to you necessarily. So, so this dot on top of price just indicates that it's the time derivative. So this P dot means it is just the change of price. Uh, so it's, it's price change or, or derivative of the price with respect to time. So therefore this P dot divided by P, it means that it's, it's this kind of change of relative price. So basically then the Hotelling's rule is saying that the, 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 the proportionate price change is equal to some constant rho. So, so this Hotelling's rule would then then predict that uh, that uh, initially the extraction would start with the with the lower lower price and over time as this as this resource reserve will be uh, smaller and smaller the there is some kind of constant growth in the in the price of that uh, that so suppose that we just just hypothetically suppose that if we would have for example um five percent uh, increase in the in the in the uh, in the price uh, constantly over time, then eventually this uh, price path would look something like in the in the diagram on the right hand side of the of the figure. So this is what uh, what this kind of optimal solution to this kind of extraction um, process would uh, would would generate. So of course, then this kind of extraction model can be can be further further complicated so here is then then a comparison of the of the how the how the market power would influence this compared to the perfect perfect competition so consider two types of situations suppose that we have this kind of uh, uh, finite reserve uh, think about for example oil reserve and suppose that there is perfect competition in the sense that there is many uh, many firms who can who can extract the oil and uh, and uh, sell it to the market? Uh, so that would be the perfect the competition scenario. Uh, but then, of course, it might be might be attempting, for example, um, to monopolize the reserve and uh, and suppose that, for example, a government take may take some kind of government uh, monopoly to to nationalize the oil reserves. Uh, so then, it's interesting question also to see how the how the monopoly would uh, uh, influence compared to a competitive market. And this uh, this figure on the left hand side illustrates that uh, that um, if we think, for example, the the just compare the first the price path. So so let's look at the uh, top right quadrant. So so um, the monopoly would initially start with the higher price because it takes into account its its uh, its uh, pricing. Uh, um it's it's monopoly profit so 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 uh, initially monopoly would would have a higher price but because this uh, uh reserve is finite irrespective of competition then uh, this perfectly competitive market would then uh, uh, extract the reserve quicker so the price would start to increase deeper and then at some point of time then then monopoly has has more uh, more reserves available and interestingly, then uh, then uh, monopoly would uh, would then con con consume this over longer time horizon, this or, or extract it over longer time horizon. So interestingly, in this case, uh, then perfect competition would would result as more steeper price increase and exhaust the, the reserve in a in a shorter time span than than a monopoly. So. This might might give at least some kind of kind of support that that, that uh, in in some situation perhaps a monopoly is not uh, not necessarily a, uh, a bad idea, and and we can also see that in this uh, in this bottom left uh, quadrant. Uh, so so notice that uh, monopoly initially starts to exhaust the reserve uh, uh, in the smaller smaller amounts, and then this reserve also will continue to be available for for longer longer time. So now let's get little bit or, or have a couple of words about the technicalities. So, so far I have just uh, illustrated the idea with the diagram 
and uh, this is because the course is intended for the for the for the bachelor level so if we uh, if we want to really really like uh, like understand this uh, uh, the bottom of this uh, this kind of uh, optimal research uh, resource extraction uh, problem uh, then we need this kind of um, dynamic optimization so on the on the right hand side of the of the uh, of the slide uh, we can see that what kind of elements are included in this kind of optimal optimization so so basically the objective functions become somewhat different if you talk about uh, perfect competition versus monopoly and uh, and um, and the demand curve is the same but the constraints are also also different when there are many many firms and then also that will be then then characterizing the the optimal solution in a, in a little bit different different way so the basic tool in this type of like like resource ex extraction models is uh, is uh, dynamic optimization and uh, this this uh, mathematics of dynamic optimization really fall fall beyond the scope of the of the present uh, uh, present course so i just give some some kind of uh, uh, hints that what kind of kind of elements are included there so you probably are aware of of, of static optimization and uh, and for example use of uh, differential calculus in uh, to solving um, static optimization problems and uh, for constraint optimization we have this uh, lagrangian lagrangian function and here in the in the case of dynamic optimization we have also here this uh, this l is, is similar to the to the to the lagrangian um in the in the um when we put it to the dynamic uh, context so then the time becomes also of importance and uh, we have this term hamiltonian so the, the hamiltonian function then uh, you can intuitively think about it as as this kind of dynamic uh, uh, corresponding to this kind of lagrangian in the in the static context so so we have this kind of hamiltonian that we that function that we utilize for 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 the optimization and uh, the constraints include this kind of we we we, we usually have some kind of uh, state variables and then we have control variables so sometimes this kind of dynamic uh, optimization problem is also called uh, optimal control problem because then basically we have some kind of uh, some kind of control variables that that can be utilized so for example in this extraction model the monopoly or, or firms they can think of how much of the resource to extract in a given point of time and then then this creates this kind of uh, uh, extraction path that, that that how much is 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 uh, extracted in a in a in a given point of time and uh, so if you are interested in this kind of uh, dynamic resource management problems then uh, then i would recommend to then study study the mathematics of uh, dynamic optimization to understand this kind of uh, this kind of how how this kind of um, optimization problems are solved but uh, but this is definitely uh beyond the scope of uh, the the present course however if you if if you might look like like uh, somewhat scary but uh, but uh, basically it's still building on the on the differential calculus and you could think about it as the as a as a kind of intertemporal extension of of this kind of uh, static optimization problems that you are probably uh, already aware of so in the next lesson then i get more practical level and uh, i will i will introduce the so-called peak oil hypothesis and then we discuss that uh, does this kind of potelings rule apply empirically to the to the price paths of of uh, non-renewable resources such as oil thanks for your attention see you next time